Weed Flower, Chapter 5. So Miko didn't wake up early the next morning, and nobody woke her up. She wondered whether that meant they all knew about the party now. She dressed and then slapped and rubbed her face to try to bring blood to her skin. She pulled the silk scarf from under the mattress, where she'd put it the day before. The scarf made her feel humiliated all over again, so she stuffed it back under the mattress. After that, she went on into the living room. Jishan was sitting in his chair reading the newspaper. He glanced at her. You go one party, and now you think you can wake up late? He scowled. That meant Bull hadn't told anyone, and neither had Tak Tak. Good morning, Jishan. You look sick, he said, eyes puffy. I'm fine. You look sick. Go tell your auntie you're sick. Sumika wished she were sick. She certainly didn't feel like working today. Sunday was her day for house cleaning and reading Japanese. If she had questions about the Japanese, she would ask Jishan. Where's Tak Tak? she asked. Outside with horse. He get bored waiting for sleepyhead. Jishan read his Japanese newspaper the whole morning. Every so often he would say things to Sumiko like, Get me tea. Or... You start rice yet? Or rub my feet. Taking care of old men's feet was one of a woman's jobs, according to Auntie. Auntie used to rub Jishan's feet until one day he accused her of trying to break his big toe. Now it was Sumiko's job. She was rubbing his toes when she heard honking from the road. She went to the front window and saw a car that looked like Mr. Hirata's driving alongside Mrs. Takashahi. As she ran down the road, crying, Miss, Mrs. Takashahi didn't pay any attention to the car. Where could she be going? She lived in the opposite direction. She was 73 years old. Sumiko had rarely seen her walk, let alone run. The car pulled up in front of Sumiko's house. It was Mr. Harata, the sweet pea king, Mrs. Takahashi kept crying and ran right past the house. Sumiko opened the door before Mr. Harata could knock. He was wearing his farm clothes and his face was dirty. He breathed hard even though he'd been driving. He removed his hat and bowed slightly to her. Sumi-chan, is your uncle home? He's out in the field. She paused. Do you want to sit down? No, may I talk to him? Mr. Harata asked, barely concealing his impatience. Jishan stood up, obviously insulted. Can I help? Mr. Hirata bowed his head respectfully and said, Matsuda-san, it's only that I should talk to your son, too. He walked a couple of steps backward, nodding respectfully at Jishan. Then he turned around and rushed through the living room with Sumiko following. They ran right through the kitchen and to the back door before he turned to her and said, Stay here. This isn't for children. The temperature was in the 70s, a perfect Southern California December day. The holes and parts of the old cheesecloth allowed the bright sun to shine on the carnations. Some days the brightness made the flowers look artificial, as if they were made of paper. But today, Samiko thought the flowers almost seemed to glow. At Mr. Ono's farm, a man was running across a field. Maybe somebody had been hurt on a tractor. That's what was wrong the last time Sumiko had seen this much commotion. When Mr. Harata reached her uncle, everyone except Bull stopped working to watch. Auntie and Ichiro walked over. Tak Tak was nowhere to be seen. Mr. Harata was speaking loudly, but Sumiko couldn't make out what he was saying. Everybody started running across the field toward the house. Tak Tak stepped out of the stable. Uncle called out sharply to him. Takeo, get inside the house. Sumiko wondered who had been hurt and how badly. Then she had a terrible thought. Maybe a fishing boat on Terminal Island had sunk, and more than one person had been hurt. When the grown-ups had almost reached her, Sumiko started to call out a question, but Uncle snapped. Get inside. He half pushed her through the doorway. He was usually very mild-mannered. Fear washed over Sumiko. Maybe a relative had been hurt in a fishing accident. 
Auntie had a cousin who fished off Terminal Island. What is it, Uncle? She followed them into the living room, where Uncle and Auntie each gave e each other one of their meaningful looks that nobody else ever knew the meaning of. They had been married since they were both twenty-one. Sumiko had the feeling that each knew exactly what the other was thinking. Their faces were pale. Jishan stood up, but then he sat down and said, Nobody tell old man. That's okay. I don't care. He pretended to be reading his newspaper. Still, nobody spoke. Another long look passed between uncle and auntie. Jishan said again, I said I don't care. Uncle knelt on the floor and took Jishan's hand as if Jishan were a little child. Hiratsa-san heard on the radio that Japan bombed Hawaii, Uncle said to Jishan. Jishan looked stricken. He softly said something that sounded like, Wa. But Sumiko knew what he'd said. War. There was another long silence as Auntie and Uncle stared at each other. The way they looked at each other scared Sumiko. Are they going to kill us? She half, half whispered. Auntie said, of course not. Don't talk like Tak Tak. Mr. Harata cleared his throat, then bowed to the room and said to Uncle, good luck. Let's talk later. He literally ran out the front door. And again, there was silence. Then Auntie announced, we'll have to burn our things. She turned to Sumiko. Get your notebooks that you practice Japanese in. To Tak Tak, she said, find all our Japanese books and magazines. Tak Tak rushed off. Sumiko turned to run off, but then she turned right back to Auntie. Burn our things, she said. What do you mean? What did burning their things have to do with the Japanese bombing Hawaii? Anything that might make them suspicious. But why, Sumiko said, suspicious of what? Iso gasa nasai. Hurry. Auntie looked so furious that Sumiko immediately ran out of the room to fetch her notebooks. She stopped in the hallway and turned back to the living room. Auntie! But Auntie wasn't listening. She was peering out the front window, so mesmerized that she didn't even notice Sumiko slip beside her. Sumiko saw a single tail of smoke rising in the distance. Others have already started, Auntie said fretfully. No one answered her, but suddenly everyone except Bull was talking at once. Then everyone stopped and Vul spoke. I should tend the flowers. We may need money. Uncle nodded, and Bull went out to the fields. I'm not going to burn my notebooks, Sumiko announced. She had worked hard to Japanese. Uncle leaned over Sumiko and shook her shoulders just once, as if shaking sense into her. If we are all arrested, who will take care of you? Now get your notebooks and anything else that seems un-American. He spoke so solemnly that Sumiko felt terrified. He spoke as if he himself might be arrested simply because she could write Japanese. She ran to her closet. For a long while, she just stood in her closet, holding her notebooks close to her. Jishan had paid old Mrs. Eek to help her write better. Mrs. Eek had also taught Sumiko's mother. By the time Sumiko got outside, Uncle had already started the fire on the dirt ground between the house and the flower fields. The wood in the fire looked like it had come from the bathhouse. Sumiko saw that on the Ono farm, the Onos had already started a fire. Sumiko held her notebooks tightly. Then she saw it. That's the picture from the bureau, she cried. You can't get arrested for that. That's my parents. She grabbed the stick her uncle was using to stoke the fire, but he took a firm hold of her arm. There's a Japanese flag in that picture, said Uncle. It's dangerous to keep. She turned to her grandfather. Jishan! But for once, Jishan had nothing to say. He just scowled at her, her as if she was misbehaving. Sumiko held her notebooks up and whispered, Bye. Then she flung them into the fire and watched them smoke and turn black. It looked like a disease had struck the papers. The fire heated Sumiko's face. Ashes flew around her like insects. 
She suddenly remembered something she'd never remembered before. Ashes flying around a fire as she and her parents burned garbage in an incinerator. Her mother saying, Wish on the floating ash, Sumi-chan, and Sumiko wishing. But she couldn't remember what she'd wished. Now she didn't move until every page had turned black and shriveled. Then Auntie made her run inside to find more things to burn. She didn't know what might be considered disloyal. If notebooks were somehow disloyal, then a Japanese silk fan also bad? And what about her kimono? Surely there was nothing dangerous about a kimono. She picked hers up, but then decided to push it far back into her closet. Except for Bull, the family spent the rest of the day combing the house for anything that seemed Japanese in a disloyal way, whatever that meant. By bedtime, Sumiko was exhausted. In the surrounding fields, a multitude of fires lit up the black night. She felt she could no longer stand up. Tak-Tak was already asleep when she got to the bedroom. His face was black with ash. She wiped his face, but he didn't even notice. She wiped listlessly at her own face. She remembered that she hadn't heated the water tonight, just as she hadn't yesterday. But nobody had said anything about it either time. She sat up in her bed and saw that, outside, her aunt and uncle were standing in the glare of the fire. Whereas earlier they had seemed feverish, now they seemed automated and emotionless. Bull was probably in the stable talking to Baba. Bull had continued to work even after dark. She knew he would make sure they didn't run out of money. Later, long after she had gotten in bed, Sumiko could hear adult voices from the living room. Finally, she sneaked into the hallway to listen. A friend of mine got beat up last week. Ichiro was saying. Some Hakujin did it. Hakujin were white people. Then there was silence until Bull said, Dad, is the rifle in the closet? No, I already took it down. It's under my bed. Sumiko heard her uncle say. Sumiko felt a chill at the world word rifle. She'd seen the rifle only once a couple of years ago when there was a burglar active in the community. The burglar was never caught, and Sumiko never saw the rifle again. She turned around and found Tak-Tak standing beside her. His mouth was hanging open. He looked terrified. The grown-ups started getting ready for bed, and Sumiko led Tak-Tak back to their room. I'll keep the blankets open, she whispered to him as she crawled in bed. She pulled the blankets apart. Okay, she said. Okay, he said. In the distance, Mr. Ono had not turned on the lights over his fields. His fire was still going strong. It was as if he no longer cared if his chrysanthemums bloomed early or not. All he cared about was burning his things.